In the States, the mm -hmm. cultural conditioning and also the propaganda is that Africans are dumb, stupid, poor, and uncool. Interesting. Yeah. And so it's, it's funny to say it now because obviously the narrative is changing slowly. People are starting to wake up to what the West actually is, you know? But, you know, when you're growing up back then, the marketing, the conditioning was like, you can't go to Africa. Even one time I wanted to give blood and I couldn't give blood as a blood donation because they said that I had lived in Africa before. So they denied me from being able to give blood when I was in high school before because I was, really? I was African. Yeah. And I was wondering, like, is my blood so bad? Like, who, I, you probably I, think you have HIV or something. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the, the conditionalizing, you know, they hated us because we were part of the reason we sold them to, you know. Oh, so they have that mindset that you sold them into slavery. Some of them do. And, then, of them. and then the other ones think that we're simply uncool. It's uncool to be African. It's better to be African American because of hip hop culture and all of these things. So they don't want to associate with you. Exactly. My teacher actually told me that I couldn't be an astronaut when I was really young. Why? Because of my skin color. She literally said, hey, you know, for people that look like you, it's better to get into maybe entertainment or something like this. This is what she told me. Another thing too, my parents, they didn't like Nigeria. They hated Africans. So this was another thing too that I was dealing with. So when I would bring African friends over, my mom, <laughs> <laughs> Get out of this house, you know, like, don't, yeah, yeah I, I couldn't, so I would have to hang out with my African friends outside of the house. Uh, yeah. While you were in Afghanistan, yeah. in a war, your fiance, your girlfriend, girlfriend in America cheated on you. Yeah. What's your way? Yeah, yeah. Damn. Yeah, I know. It was, it was hard. And How it was like, it, it was literally felt like a movie. Because we had a little booth where you had the phone and you could call. So I go in this call booth, I'm looking to my right side, and I see this guy arguing with his girl. <laughs> I looked to my left side because, you know, it's like different call, call booths and this guy's crying with his girl. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so I call mine and she's like, we're talking, everything's good. And she's like, I have something to tell you. And my heart just dropped. And she told me I was at the party and blah, 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 blah. And, and the only reason she told me is because I had friends who would have told me anyways. anyways. Hello, guys. So welcome back again to another amazing, amazing episode. And this is the Diaspora Transition episode where we have dialogue with Diaspora you know, who decided to leave the diaspora and move back to the continent of Africa, doing something great here to rebuild uh, their life here on the continent. And uh, today we do have here someone very special, a Nigerian uh, born in the, in the U.S., but decided to, you know, leave the U.S. behind to embark on a journey to his roots. And, uh, you know, he's in Ghana, but he's a Nigerian. So you'll get into why he decided to come to Ghana instead of going to Nigeria. And I basically share his story with us. So without further ado, name, welcome on the show. Hey guys, so my name is Van Dross Idiake, aka the Moon Boy is what they call me too as well. Uh, it's part of my company, Moon Boy Capital Ventures. And as the host just said, I originally Nigerian. Mm -hmm. And I actually, I was born in Nigeria. So then I moved to the States when I was four years old. Oh, you're born in Nigeria? Born in Nigeria, Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, so my parents are originally from Benin. Benin. Benin City. I yeah. see. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So four years old, you, you relocated to America. Mm -hmm. Were your parents already there? So how it worked was my dad came first. And actually, my dad didn't even see me get born. So he was in the States while my mom was actually, you know, still mm -hmm. pregnant with me and then ended up having me. And then uh, so I didn't get to see my dad until I came over to the States. And then, um, yeah, that's how the journey basically started. Mm -hmm. And yeah. It's, it's been wild, bro. Wow. Yeah. How's it been? I mean, four years old, relocating yeah. to well advanced country like America. Where were you in America? Where were you? We started. So we started out in Virginia. Virginia. So I was okay. in uh, Manassas and uh, Bristol, these type of areas. And then we ended up relocating in the Atlanta area in uh, Gwinnett County. Actually, uh, the Migos live very close to us. Oh, um, really? Yeah. yeah the, they, the rappers, Migos? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, actually, their school was kind of rival. We, I was at Collins Hill High School, mm -hmm. and so um, they were actually rival to us. Uh, I think they were in Berkmar, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, that's basically how it, it went in the States. But actually, when I first got there, it was very hard to integrate when I was there. And mm. um, so when I came there, you know, the kids, you know, laughing, calling me. African booty scratcher and all these different types of names and it was hard you know and also you know you see people that look similar to you when you're there and you think you can relate and then come to find out that you realize that you can't how oh. because what ends up happening is that in the states mm -hmm. the cultural conditioning is and also the propaganda is that Africans are dumb stupid poor and uncool 
Interesting. Yeah. And so <laughs> it's, it's funny to say it now because obviously the, the narrative is changing slowly. People are starting to wake up to what the West actually is, you know. But, you know, when you're growing up back then, the marketing, the conditioning was like you can't go to Africa. Even one time I wanted to give blood and I couldn't give blood as a blood donation because they said that I had lived in Africa before. So they denied me from being able to give blood when I was in high school before because I was, really? I was African. Yeah. These are the type of nuances that, and I was wondering, like, is my blood so bad? Like, I you probably I, think you have HIV or something. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the, the conditionalizing, you know, and trying to relate with African-Americans was super difficult. And what I found was that either one, they hated us because we were part of the reason we sold them to, you know, Oh, so they have that mindset that you sold them into slavery. Some of them do. And, then, of them. and then the other ones think that we're simply uncool. Mm. It's uncool to be African. It's better to be African-American because of hip-hop culture and all of these things. So they don't want to associate with you. Exactly. And so I couldn't associate with them. Then I couldn't associate with the white people. And actually, my first best friend that I ever had when I was in the U.S. was actually Asian. Asian. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I heard a lot of people say that they were more like friends with Asians, Mexican, uh, most Africans, yes. Asians and Mexican than African Americans themselves. Absolutely. The, the first actual girl that I actually, you know, had a sexual encounter with was actually uh, Latino. Interesting. So, and that was because also, that's another thing too, the black African American woman mm -hmm. They like the thug type of guy, the guy that's, you know... At least you need to kill, like, five people. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If not, they will not date you. Yeah, and I was the guy raising my hand. I was a nerd, you know, in class, you know? And all the time raising my hand, getting good grades, going to school, yeah. not ditching school, not selling drugs. And so I was seen as uncool. Mm. And so this was a, another reason why it was hard in the beginning for me to date. So I dated where my demand was. You know, I just simply moved over. It's, it's simple supply and demand. So yeah. if, you, if you're unattractive with this particular race. And if race, you're not yeah, yeah, they just didn't appreciate until later. Mm. And by that time, I had built up a lot of resentment, actually, um, towards just the entire situation of how African-Americans think, how they operate. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand like why they acted the way they do, but then mm -hmm. I realized that it's all by design, you know, mm -hmm. and- When you say it's all by design, what do you mean by that? Did you know that smart contract developers make around $120,000 per year? We are building the biggest Web3 talent pool in Africa, linking you to companies looking to outsource cheaper labor. Find out and join us at helico.xyz. And as always, see you Space Cowboy. So let's take it back to 1964 and, and civil rights movement, you know, like after the, the Civil Rights Act and everything, and we were seen as, you know, human beings, human beings finally, right? Mm -hmm. Apparently. Well, who owns all the infrastructure, right? Well, it's, it's no, not black people, right? Mm -hmm. And so the problem is, you say you're well qualified, and you're a black person, and you go and go try to look for a job, mm. well, who's the one that's supposed to be hiring you? So obviously they're not gonna hire you. They'd rather hire somebody that's underqualified, that doesn't look like you. So now you're over here scrambling, trying to find work, and can't find work for the position that you're mm. worthy of. So a lot of them end up resorting to the black market, because they still have families to feed. Mm -hmm. So how do you feed your family if you can't get it the normal way? And so you resort then to the black market, you end up going to jail, the jails are privatized, mm. so, and they actually receive subsidies from the government the more people that they put in the jail. Interesting. So who do they attack the minorities? Because the minorities then you know, have no resources, it's very hard for them to defend themselves. Mm. They don't have like a, usually you know, in other communities you have like a, a family friend that's a lawyer, a family friend that's a, someone that understands the, the criminal justice system. And we don't have that. So you, you usually end up being naked, basically, and having to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. And you end up losing in these court cases and you end up going to jail. Then now you have kids that are getting raised up in the system without a father. Mm. And then it starts this feedback loop. And then on top of that, you integrate drugs <laughs> into the entire system, equation. Yeah. And so it's systematic. Then on top of that, they put us in these locations, these areas, and uh, they end up putting, doing less funding in these areas. And so the top quality talent leaves, 
And then so what's left is, is whatever is there. And then guess what? Assets, they, they depreciate in value because nobody wants to live there. Mm -hmm. The quality of education goes down because mm -hmm. the, the school teachers that are good leave. The good lawyers, doctors, they, they all leave out of those so areas. So their brain is drained. Mm. And this is like a form of like redlining is what they call it, you know. So these are the type of really, really hard systematic, mm -hmm. uh, I call it systematic oppression, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But you being a Nigerian yes. um, and growing up within this system, when would you say you caught up to speed with what has been done to that community, the black community in the U.S.? I think once I got out of the U.S., because I knew there was something inherently wrong with the U.S., mm -hmm. I could see the food quality going down. This is 11 years ago, you know, when I was realizing this, I was telling people this 15, 16, 17, but I didn't have the level of articulation that I have now, and I didn't have the level of understanding of the world. Mm. So I knew that that was a problem I needed to solve. So I, I was trying to figure out how can I get outside of the U.S. because mm. I see they feeding this propaganda. They're in like the states, and everywhere else is like a third world country. Mm. And this is the mentality in the U.S. That you had. I want to be able to jump into the point where you, you went out of the U.S., but let's yeah. just go back to the beginning of your story. Yeah. Um, growing up, did you grow up with both parents? Yes. Okay, how was that like growing up with them as an African parents living in America yeah. and even your school trajectory and even graduating and even you went to the military, is yeah. that so? Yeah, yeah. So can we just go in that trajectory real quick? So growing up with African parents, it was, it was good, inherently good, you know, mm. overall when you look back at it, but... You know, when your friends are being able to go party out late, you can't and, yeah, you get, <laughs> and you know, you, you come home with a with a eighty percent on on a score on one of your tests, and dad's like, ah, go back and get the other twenty percent. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> where's the other twenty percent? You know, and so you, you always had and was were basically put to have to be in a higher standard. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. and that was kind of how how I grew up. You know, it was basically you are a high standard person, and you should definitely. You, you have to basically live up to that standard that they, that they, it, that they see yeah. for you, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult because your friends want you to, you know, go outside, want to go party, want to go do this, want to go Just do that. Just be a teenager. Yes, exactly. And I, I didn't get that opportunity. Another thing, too, as well, is my parents didn't understand how the entire element of schooling was and how much I was bullied. And I remember the first time that my parents, because I was putting pressure on them to get me. Another thing in the States that you don't understand is the mm -hmm. consumerism. Mm. So... Mm -hmm. I was, I was putting pressure on my parents to get me new Jordans or new Air Forces or something new, and they could never afford it. So um, I remember the first time I finally got a good pair of shoes, and they were used to, the kids used to pick on me a lot, you know, because I didn't have, you know, brand. You didn't name have the brand. cool things. Exactly. And this was, you, wearing the same shirt in the same week was like crazy in the States. If you do that, they start clowning you. Do you know, I never knew that it's a thing that you can't wear your shirt more than twice yeah. <laughs> <laughs> until i met an american i'm like oh so you can't yeah you can't if they, if they don't let don't go to school like that because they'll see it like ah you're poor and it's like well i'm like 14 i can't work yeah <laughs> you know it has nothing to do with me but this is just the mentality just to tell you how the deep-rooted mentality of consumerism mm -hmm. so i remember this one time i was in school and i finally got these new pair of uh, Allen iversons and i put my feet mm -hmm. on the desk you know, to show people that I had yeah, these new yeah, I got it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I've arrived, you know, <laughs> big man, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, my teacher told me to take my shoes off the table, and I didn't do it. And then eventually, you know, I ended up getting suspended from school. And then, you know, my parents, you know, they disciplined me how Nigerian parents discipline. Mm. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, that's just to tell you a little bit. And so, trying to translate this type of sort of experience to my parents was very hard. It was very, very difficult. They didn't understand that you were being bored. They didn't understand they it didn't or understand. what? They didn't understand. You know, you're, you're trying to explain to them how the dynamics are, and they don't understand because mm -hmm. they think, oh, everything's civilized, everything is... Mm -hmm. it's, it's complete... School is war mm -hmm. in the States. It's war. It's, mm -hmm. it's not... It's not it, it, think about it. You're going to a location, you're forced to be psychologically programmed to be taught how to think about certain topics they want you to know, but they don't tell you a lot of information that you really need to know, like African history. You know, my teacher actually told me that I couldn't be an astronaut when I was really young. Why? Because of my skin color. She literally said, hey, you know, for people that look like you, it's better to get into maybe entertainment or something like this. This is what she told me. So imagine the, 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 the psyche and the hurdles that you have to, have to battle what's going on in the school system. Another thing too, my parents, 
they, they didn't like Nigeria. They hated Africans. Mm. So this was another thing, too, that I was dealing with. So when I would bring African friends over, my mom, hey, <laughs> get out of this house, you know, like, don't. Really? Yeah, I, I couldn't. So I would have to hang out with my African friends outside of the house. And, um, you know, it was, it was very, very Why? Frustrating. Why do you think they were doing that? Because they, they went through a lot of pain and hardship when they were in uh, Benin, the city of Benin, Nigeria. And uh, this is what I found out later when I went ahead started doing research to understand and I started seeing that they went through like crazy stuff with scammers from their from their family my dad was sending money back to Nigeria and to, to build homes and it never got built mm. so much so my parents just eventually when I was younger we would go visit you know or family would come visit and eventually when I was about eight or nine mm -hmm. it, maybe a little bit maybe about 11 12 mm -hmm. is when like we immediately everything was cut off interesting completely like we stopped talking to them completely your own family? Yeah. Outside of my immediate family, like yeah. we, stopped, we, yeah, we stopped talking uncles, wow. aunts, even grandmas. Wow. Stopped talking to them completely. Interesting. Yeah. So then they begin to treat even your own friends like that, like get out of yes, the house. Yes, exactly. Interesting. How did that do to you psychologically? It was tough what, what because to every, to be honest with you, every time I met an African, I can't say African American because my experiences have been different with them mm -hmm. because they're always chasing the next high, the next cool. You know, whereas Africans were more grounded and they could see the smoke behind the mirrors. They were way more conscious. And so this is why I cling to, you know, some of my best friends I still have to this day, like from Rwanda mm. and so on, you know. And um, I just love being in that environment. And I didn't understand my parents could hate something that they look like. Mm. That's deep, you know. Yeah. They hate something that they, they look exactly like the same. Yeah. So they're hating themselves. Exactly. Interesting. And... This was, this was the hardest thing for me to, mm. to get over, you know, because mm. when you're growing up in this type of environment, and also the, the worst part is I, have, I grew up with five other brothers, so they couldn't see what I saw. And mm. even to this day, I still have issues with trying to break down information about the outside world to them because they can't see it from my lens because I left... They have a very myopic view of the world, just from America perspective. Exactly. Interesting. And this is, this is where I started realizing that I was going this way. And they were drifting the other way. And they were way. drifting the other way. And mm -hmm. they, they don't understand what actually happened with the history of why Africa is currently today. I don't even think they're that interested. Mm -hmm. America is just all about money. Mm -hmm. So for them, doing initiatives, doing things for the community, if it's, not bringing, in, yeah, if it's not bringing in dollars... There's not a so lot of profit. It's like more of a selfish mentality. It's, 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 I think the, this, is, this is a good example. I don't know if, we wanna, if you want to get to this right now. Mm -hmm. but, Go ahead. But I, the conclusion I came to throughout the entire, basically, adventure that I've been on to discover what exactly happened with Africa, why does the world work the way it was, I was always so curious. Why does it work the way it does? And, and what I found, the conclusion was that the money itself, fiat, Mm -hmm. is, is, is corrupt. Mm -hmm. And basically, after our colonial masters left Africa, they created this system called fiat currency. And they basically used marketing and branding positioning to make everybody believe that their fiat currency was better than ours. Mm -hmm. And so this is how this whole financial game really took how? off. Elaborate right? on that. Yeah. How so, did they do that? So basically, after 1971, mm -hmm. We went away from the, the gold standard, right? So money was not backed by anything. So it's controlled by the central bank, right? Who effectively, they give the money out to the private banks who then loan it out to other people for a low interest rate in the West, right? And, and this thing can even be uh, sort of uh, exacerbated on if you look at you know, the IMF that was created you know, after World War II to basically help with global conflicts, but it's controlled by who? The United States. Mm. And so they use this as leverage to, A, if Africa wants to develop, they oppose these austerity measures, right? And it pushed these hard austerity measures and basically to control our countries so we're not actually sovereign, right? And then they, they give us high interest rates, 30%. Mm. That eats into your margins, mm -hmm. right? And so you get a shitty loan deal, and then you get you lose control of your, of your sovereignty as a country, right? Mm. And so you end up with, in the situation in Africa is people are corrupt because they're chasing a money that's not even real in the system mm. that doesn't even want us to be involved. You understand? Mm. And so yes, this, is, this is the conclusion I came to, and this is why I end up starting Moon Boy, you know? 
um, to teach. Right now, we just, we just uh, started an initiative right now to teach Africans and Africans from the diaspora about what is money, because everything starts there, breaking down what is money, getting to all the different elements and the nuances of money, how it crashes every single time. Mm -hmm. Because the money, if it's not backed by anything, even in the Rome was part of the reason why it crashed, because they started filling the, the coins that they were making with, with fake material. Right? And then the material started rusting and then there was more and more and more inflation. That was part of the reason why Rome crashed. If you look at the, the Zimbabwe, if you look at uh, Germany after World War I, when they have to pay for the war, war, they inflated the currency to pay for the war in World War I. That's when Hitler came and took advantage of that and blamed everybody, right? Um, mm. And so the fiat itself is corrupt and it's only controlled by a few people. So what's essentially happening is every time the government wants to or feels like it, they steal our wealth. Like it's, it's, it's a hidden form of, a, of tax mm. because say you, you, you're making, let's say, I don't know, like $100 this month, you know, in, a, in an African country or whatever. And the next month you need $110 because the money is, is basically being pumped into the system, but it's only being in the hands of the few, mm -hmm. right, before it gets to you or people who own assets who also reap the benefit too as well through this form of inflation. Mm -hmm. This is how prices go higher and people get stressed. Mm -hmm. So... The, the problem in Africa right now is they don't realize that we have the true riches, right? Which is the natural resources, right? And the raw materials mm -hmm. and the relationship capital, right? Whereas in the West, they made a Fugazi system that now the politicians are controlled by to the point that they're chasing this Fugazi system and in return for cheap labor and natural resources mm. and being exploited. Mm, interesting. So this is basically what, I, what I'm teaching in this academy. Currently right now we have over 200 signups. And uh, we're trying to basically bridge this knowledge gap and also mm -hmm. bridge the diaspora back to Africa to mm -hmm. bring their working capital because there's billions of, just in the States alone, the African diaspora has billions of dollars mm -hmm. working capital that mm -hmm. it can bring here to Africa to help build up Africa, but they just don't understand Africa mm -hmm. because of the propaganda and the marketing that's been pushed by who and who owns, who owns those, those companies, who mm -hmm. controls those companies, right? So this is why I like podcasts like this who are mm -hmm. looking to try to change that narrative. And I'm happy that you were able to get me on so I could mm -hmm. share this message to mm -hmm. people to really understand what is really happening. Mm -hmm. I like your mindset, though. But mm -hmm. it always it, the most interesting part to me is how you got to this mindset that you have. Yeah. And that's why I want us to shine light on yeah. what happened, to, you know. You said you had to, I mean, what when you finish junior high school, senior high school, university, what point, what did you do for work? You went into the military, like, and let's yeah. just walk through that part so, and then bring it all the way back to Africa yes. and what you're doing here and everything. Absolutely. So when I was 19, um, I was playing college basketball and I ended up losing my scholarship because that was a way in which I was planning to leverage to go overseas to play mm -hmm. basketball. And as you see, you know, I'm pretty tall. I'm like 6'4". So. Yeah, you're <laughs> and, very uh, tall. Yeah, so... I'm six foot, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I ended up doing was, because I lost my scholarship, and you know how the United States works and how it functions with the tuition yeah. fees is quite high. Mm. So you're left with not so many options. You can maybe try to pursue an academic scholarship, which is hard if you didn't get it immediately after high school. Mm. It's still possible. You know, there's different programs and stuff, but I didn't want to waste time because I didn't want to waste my youth. Because I understand time is very valuable and youth is even more valuable mm -hmm. than anything. Because when you're a teenager, a lot of people don't understand that is the best time to take risk. Mm -hmm. It's the best. you're just single. Exactly. You're single. You don't have a lot of responsibilities. You can always leverage your parents a little bit here and there mm -hmm. or family. But mm -hmm. when you're 30, 35, it, it becomes a lot, a lot harder. And so um, what I ended up doing was I decided, because my friend was telling me about the Army and how I could play basketball there and I could travel and you know, I could choose whatever duty station I wanted and et cetera, I could put all this stuff in the contract. And so I was like, man, I really don't want to, to do this, but mm -hmm. for me, I'm a risk taker and it looks like the best suitable situation for me now. And also when you get out, they give you a lot of benefits, you get to, they pay for your school, they pay you a salary on top mm -hmm. of paying you tuition. You can, you can go to school anywhere around the world. And so the risk to reward made sense for me at the time. And of course, you know, having Nigerian parents, <laughs> <laughs> they were super against it, you know. Like, really? hey, <laughs> you want to do what? You know? <laughs> they didn't want you to go to the military? Of course not. Of course not. They were super scared. It was hard for me to fight to get my documentation and um, end up getting it anyways, end up signing up and joining. And um, 
I just remember going to my first duty station, which was in Germany, in Grafenbrühl. And so my sergeant comes to pick me up, and I'm super excited because my first time stepping outside of the U.S., so for me it was like, huge you know a big deal and I was excited I was telling him yeah I'm super excited I can't wait to like see how the city looks I can't wait to, till we get off of work get off the uniform and go outside and he was like no no are you are you excited about uh or prepared for us because we're about to go to war mm. and I said what and I was like I'll see you guys when you guys get back <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he just he just looked at me he's like no no, no you're, you're coming with us and um I just remember my heart just, just like beating like crazy. And I was like, man, because I just graduated. What year was that? This is in 2013. So I, I did basic training. And then after that, I did advanced individual training called AIT. Mm. And so you have a specialization within the military. Because military runs like a regular business organization. Mm. There's, there's infantry. There's logistics. There's HR. It runs completely just like that. So they train you with those skill sets. Mm. And you then leverage that in the military to be mm. able to you know, optimize the military. And so I was in transportation and I was just remember my heart beating super, super fast. We were in the Humvee, which is like a military vehicle to like drive um, to the actual location where my company was and where I will be staying in this thing called a barracks. It's another term that maybe people that are watching barracks. understand is like a dorm, oh, dormitory. Dorm, yeah, yeah, it's like it's like a military version yeah. of a dorm. Mm -hmm. We call it an army yeah, we barracks. Know, bar we know barracks. Yeah. 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 And um, so... He was telling me like, hey, yeah, you need to be prepared. We're leaving in three months. We're going to be doing a whole bunch of training before we go. And um, long story short, to fast forward, um, I didn't know what to expect. And I knew that that might be the last moment for me to live my life like how, you know. And I was like, well, you know. Because it's a war. Anything can happen. Anything can happen, you know. But um, fast forward, you know, uh, I went through that. We did, we did nine months in Afghanistan. I went through that. That uh, was the hardest moment in my life. My, I also had a, a, a girlfriend at the time. She cheated on me <laughs> while I was in wait, Afghanistan. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. While you were in Afghanistan, yeah. in a war, your fiance, your girlfriend, girlfriend in America cheated on you. Yeah. What's your way? Yeah, yeah. Damn. Yeah, I know. It was, it was hard. And how it was like, it, it, was, it was like how it is. In a, it was literally felt like a movie. Mm. Because we had a little booth, call booth, where you had the phone and you could call. So I go in this call booth. I'm looking to my right side and I see this guy arguing with his girl. <laughs> I look to my left side because, you know, it's like different call, call booths. And this guy's crying with his girl. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> so I call mine and she's like, we're talking, everything's good. And she's like, I have something to tell you. And my heart just dropped. And she told me I was in the party and blah, 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 blah. And, and the only reason she told me is because I had friends who would have told me anyways. Anyways. Yeah. So she felt like... Shit, yeah, and so, um, yeah, it was really, really hard. Um, just to just sum it up, it was a really hard time for me, but I learned a lot about myself and about the world. Um, I started asking a lot of questions when I was in the military, and I realized I wasn't getting the right answers that I wanted. So that's where the questions start popping in your mind. After, during the, the service in, in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan. Mm. And I realized, oh, they, they, they don't want me to know certain things. And... There's a lot of things that I can't speak on camera, but there's, just, there's a lot that what I started figuring out, you know, through asking questions and then coming to that same point of, oh, I, I can't ask any more questions anymore. Oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> and uh, so this started me to investigate then international relations in the U.S. and what that actually really means. Why do we have all these military bases everywhere? You know, why do we control the money? Why are we the global reserve currency? How did all this come to be? Then I started going, peeling back the onion to Bretton Woods Act after the World War II, where U.S. became then the global reserve currency. Then 1971, we took off the gold standard, mm. started printing money like crazy, stealing our future. Through the, stealing our future. Through the, through the form of money printing and debasement of currency. Can which, you speak on that? I think, is it last two years or during the pandemic, they printed the most they, money they've they, ever They've ever printed. They've, they almost doubled the money supply within the last four years that they, that they typically had, you know? So the money is, is continuing to increase in circulation at a rapid pace because the debt is starting to increase too as well. And we're at the point right now where the debt to GDP ratio is really, really bad, meaning that the, the debt itself is outpaced the, the economic production and how does how does the government make money right they either print the money or they get it from tax mm. or they borrow the money mm -hmm. 
right, from other people. This is the only way that this is the, it's, a, it's a perfect business model because <laughs> you're never out of business. You can just make more money, make more units. But the problem is there's only a limited amount of goods and services. So it increases the prices for everything. And the U.S. has the privilege to be able to say, ah, you know, our people are lazy and, you know, um, our economic production isn't that great, but we still want these imports. So what they do is they go ahead and borrow the money mm -hmm. and then they export the inflation to the rest of the world. How? They, because they're, the imports that are coming in that they are selling, the imports that are coming in that, they are, that, they are, that the international people are selling to America, what they end up doing is America buys them with dollars mm -hmm. and those dollars get shipped out to those people who bought it, right? So if, if I had a good or service I'm selling to America and I'm from Kenya, I then in return get dollars. Well, those dollars are inflating like every other currency, so what do I do with those dollars? I regurgitate them back to the United States in the form of stocks, treasury bonds, to at least keep up with the rate of inflation, which makes America rich. Mm. And this is the system that they've put in place to where they don't have to work for, for things, right? And this is what some countries are starting to wake up. If you look at what's happening with Kenya, you know, it's starting to de-dollarize. You know, you see what's going on with BRICS. They're starting to realize that America, and also if you look at the world, 29% of the world is sanctioned by the SWIFT banking system, which is owned by the United States, right? Mm. So if, I have a, if I'm Iranian and I'm working in the States, how do I get money to my grandma in Iran? Mm. I can't do it with the SWIFT banking system. And this is, again, why the emergence of cryptocurrency came about, to bypass the system using a peer-to-peer -peer sort of a technology that's all ran through code and math. Right, and it's completely decentralized in these, in these networks. This is the type of stuff that I teach. But first, before I get to even all of that, I talk about what is money. Because mm -hmm. if you don't understand what money is, this thing that you're chasing and you're killing people for, and you're in you know all these different sins that you're committing for it, then you'll never understand why this new technology exists. Mm -hmm. So I always have to start with the root of the problem, right? And so this is the system that we're in right now. And you see the U.S. push a button; they they basically shut Russia out of the SWIFT banking system which they don't understand, they're only accelerating their own demise because Russia then is just taking them the dollars and dumping them, right? And they're <laughs> more or less valuable. Exactly. So it's just accelerating your own demise and, and the rest of the, the, the country is starting to wake up and starting to see what this actually really is, mm -hmm. you know? And um, even when you look at the likes of what's happening in colonialism, you look at what's going on uh, now with the, with the riots and um, the, the dethronement of, of old regimes that were puppets, mm -hmm. you know? These, in these Francophone countries, you know, if you look at you know, Mali, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, uh, Ibrahim Traore, and so on. So I look at the landscape of basically how all these things work in the macro scale and the conclusion I came to is the money itself is evil, right? Mm. And uh, it's used to control us and make us chase that instead of chase relationships. And Africa as a whole needs to realize that we are in control because we have the natural resources. We don't need to... What, let me just break something down to you. Mm. What, what people want, people don't want money, right? Mm -hmm. What people want are goods and services, right? Mm -hmm. They don't care what the medium of exchange actually is. But if we could fix that medium of exchange to make it beneficial for all, having a fixed supply of something, what would, let, me, let me break something down to you, right? Mm -hmm. Capitalism itself was actually designed to make life cheaper, right? Let me explain what I mean by that. If I have a problem and someone comes, hey, oh, I see you have a problem, and then goes and solves it, and we exchange, okay, you, you, you have a service that solves my problem, and then how are we going to exchange? We have this uniformly agreed upon medium of exchange. We trade that amongst each other, which is this new technology you know, that we've created. You know, I call it a technological advancement with fiat mm -hmm. advancement, if you will. And uh, that's how it works. But then someone else sees, oh, there's multiple people with the same problem. So they start a business. Then another person starts a business. But it's only a limited amount of people with mm -hmm. that problem. But there's an endless amount of people who could solve it, mm -hmm. right? So actually, what should happen is prices should come down because they're all competing for market share. Mm. So eventually, everything gets competitive. And what differentiates your business from the other business? Pricing, marketing, branding. Mm. So the prices should actually be falling, mm -hmm. especially as we advance in society. They should actually be falling if there's more and more competition within the marketplace. Mm. But the money itself is the problem. It's corrupt mm. because it's controlled by a few. And anytime they feel like it, they print more and more of it. And then they put it in the hands of the people who are corrupt. They get it first. And then you, 
at the, as the end consumer pay the grunt of the inflation and also the people who win and the people who own assets because they teleport that money using that asset as a vehicle to preserve their wealth. Mm. And this is basically what's happening. And so um, I, I try to make people in the diaspora and also in Africa understand what is going on exactly and how we could potentially change it, you know, mm. with these new sort of decentralized ecosystems that are more equitable, where no one has, there's no single authority of these, of these new uh, sort of How, how do you think um, that can change it? How? What way? Yeah, well, if, if you look at, for instance, crowdfunding, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's a way in which, okay, uh, I have a project that I want to, let's say, develop, but I don't know how to get the liquidity. You could create these systems where mm -hmm people could drop liquidity, let's say in the form of a, of, a, of a token or cryptocurrency, package it through a smart contract and protect it, do locked smart contracts, these sorts of things, these sorts of nuanced things that could help say, okay, this is the liquidity, this is the amount that you can take out, it's all transparent on a blockchain, we all can see it, you know? And I think that's the difference, is when they print money, we can't see where the money is, it's not transparent, right? All we know is prices are going higher and we're all just kind of sweating, trying to figure out what the, what the solution is, you know? You see the prices are, are very high for, for real estate. One thing that we could do to solve that is again, having these sort of, um, these tokenization models mm -hmm. where we could leverage these as investment vehicles to be able to, everyone can pitch in the community mm -hmm. to be able to invest in these things, you know? And you could tokenize these things in the form of like NFTs or, you know, in a, in a token and, and things, you know? So we have to think about also, if you look at distribution, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's another thing. When I make music, I have to go on this platform that doesn't then pay me what I'm supposed to be getting paid, all right? So if there was a way I could bypass this intermediary and the person could then come directly to me and we could create this sort of system where I know exactly what's coming in and what's coming out and we could do all this stuff programming, like with programs, you know, with automated programs and mathematical equations. So. These are the types of, of ideas and things that, that I have that I plan to bring to the diaspora and I plan to train them on the skill sets needed mm. and to be able to leverage that, also to even be more competitive in the, in the labor force so they don't have to leave. Mm. Because I have networks that need, because there's, there's a labor shortage. I don't know if you know what's going on in the West, but they're, they're falling apart because there's less and less young people in the West, where there's more and more in Africa. Mm. And these people are, they're lazy, they don't want to work, in America. And, and, and everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's happening all around the West, mm -hmm. you know, and there's not enough of them. And this is why artificial intelligence is coming in to try to at least subsidize the situation because eventually they're going to have to export the labor to Africa <laughs> because 70% of, Af of Africa is like age 30 and younger. Yeah. And so what I realize is, hey, if you're going to pay this, this developer here in the West, let's say $4,000 a month, I got an African that will do it for $2,000 a month, mm -hmm. right? So that way he can, he can basically do the skill set but stay here it's all online he doesn't have to leave the money circulates here and it goes back into the businesses here and so this is what i plan to try to achieve with this web 3 academy and so um what is the name um right now it's, it's helicode on chain academy mm. and uh yeah i'll send you the links and so you know people can check it out but why, why would you choose ghana over nigeria because oh god you are nigerian yeah, and yeah. if anything you should go back to i mean that's how yeah. we think right yeah but, why would you say you strategically picked or chose Ghana? Well, Ghana was the first to basically get its, its independence, you know. So for me, they're, they're very pan-Africanist at heart. You know, when I speak to Nigerians, it's a bit different. It's a bit different. Um, also, uh, Ghana's a bit more, more relaxed, you know, than, than how it is in, in Nigeria. Nothing against Nigeria or anything. It's just a bit different, you know, um, in terms of integrating into you know society and everything there's a lot of nuance in nigeria that you need to be very very careful of mm. you know when you're dealing with uh a lot of stuff you know and also you know the the constant electricity also too as well plays a role um when you look at how you know nigeria set up with the monopoly that they have mm -hmm. which you know we won't get too much into it but <laughs> we know what that is what that's about why they, they haven't been able to achieve that yet um so these are some of the things that you know i i look at when i look at ghana and i also have a lot of connects here too as well because i have friends that are, Ghanaian. Mm. And so this is the reason why I'm, I'm choosing Ghana to come back mm -hmm. um, to, to build here and um, to stay here, you know, because uh, I believe in Africa becoming one whole 
unit. Mm. And it's starting, you know, a little bit when you see how they're starting to try this uh, integration with um, if you register a company in one African country, it's basically good for the rest of Africa. So they've started this now, this initiative, mm -hmm. and then eventually the freedom of movement will come. It's going to come, but it took Europe, what, like 30 years to get it together. And they mm -hmm. still didn't really fully get it together. There's a, there's a bunch of, because they have three different sort of branches between the Eurozone, the EU, and uh, what's the third one that I'm missing? The Eurozone, the EU, Schengen, Schengen area. Schengen, yeah, yeah. yeah, and so, uh, some countries are, are just only in the Eurozone and, and the Schengen, some are you know, in the EU and the Eurozone, so, so it's all mixed. And some of them aren't in anything at all. You know? I think the UK just left the Schengen zone. The, yes, exactly. So it's still not completely perfect, you know? but if we can get it somewhat working, it would be great. Because if, you're, if let's say you're a businessman and you're in the Gambia, mm -hmm. well, the market is very small. Very but if you can open that market up to all of Africa, it makes your market very large. So yeah. I think it makes a huge difference mm -hmm. in helping us, you know. Um, and also, uh, the liquidity aspect too as well, you know. So I think this is going to help mm -hmm. Africa flourish a lot more instead of um, depending on one market, you know, we can open up instead of having one singular market, we have a you know, multifaceted market, you know. But when we start trading among ourselves and it opens up, what do you think about the currency situation? Because our next neighbor uses a whole different currency. Yeah. from what we use we in ghana we use city nigeria we, they use nara the next it's like different different um fiat currencies that yes. you, you already mentioned is corrupt y yes. how are you looking at the future of this you know countries trading among themselves are you look yeah. i i would love to say bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> i would love to but you know obviously the the government's it would be very hard for them to integrate that. It would take a selfless leader, like what's happening in El Salvador, what they did adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. It's worked wonders for them, and the IMF hates it so much because they're actually getting um, they're richer, you know, with Bitcoin, the asset appreciation, because you understand the mechanisms of how it works. Every four years, the prices will increase and, uh, and trade against the fiat currency. The fiat currency is going down mm -hmm. while, you know, Bitcoin will continue to rise forever because of the mechanisms there in place. Mm -hmm. So the El Salvadorian president understood that and leveraged that because they were dollarized right and they, he had two options either one he makes his own fiat currency but then how do you get people to adopt it the last one crashed it's too risky right so it's like well when the u.s exports inflation and when they when they lower interest rates we do not get the advantage of that cheap debt hmm. we just get the inflation <laughs> and that's what some countries don't understand the dollarized so i don't think the dollar is, is necessarily the answer mm -hmm. there's bricks that's coming there's bitcoin as another option and what gaddafi mm -hmm was trying to implement was the that gold, yeah. one currency where it was going to be backed by gold. We have all the gold. But he was assassinated because of that. Of course. By who? <laughs> they know. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get but too much into know. that. But, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying. So we, we have options in which we could use and leverage. But for sure, this having different fiat currencies, mm -hmm. It needs to go away, you know, maybe even having an ECOWAS currency, something like this to, you know, standardize things would make sense, you know, for now. Mm -hmm. But for me, I don't think fiat is the, is the answer long term. For the past one year, most African currencies has been depreciating against the U.S. dollar. It's crazy. In 2021, 22, yeah. um, one, Ghana, one dollar is to 5.67 Ghana cities. Yeah. Um, 2024 is 13 Ghana cities. Within the past four, three to four years, it has devalued over 100 percent. Yeah. Now you are understanding how the manipulation works. Where is this problem coming from? And even Nigeria is worse. You can't even compare um, the depreciation happening in Nigeria to Ghana. It's probably 400 percent in Nigeria and other African countries. What do you think is is, is happening? There's, there's, there needs to be demand mechanisms for your currency to exist longer, I would say. The currencies are going to go to zero. Every, every fiat currency in history goes to zero. The dollar would just be last to fall because of the global reserve currency, but they have demand mechanisms in place for us to want to buy dollars. If I'm Kenya, again, making this example, and let's say I'm trying to sell a coffee mug to you, Ghanaian, I don't have cities or if you give me cities i don't know what to do with the what do i do with the cities there's no financial real instruments stuff isn't put in place to do something with the cities because the cities are going to lose value because of inflation mm -hmm. and you know you don't want you don't have any kenyan shillings you know so how do we trade well the u.s dollar right mm. 
<laughs> and so, so as an intermediate that creates a demand value. mechanism mm. to where people are not chasing that to put that in the reserves for international trade mm. so it, it depreciates so, less so anytime you conduct business they get profit just exactly. by reusing their money exactly and that's what made their because it creates more demand for it mm. right so then to the point where oh I, i'd rather not hold the cities i'd rather hold you know u.s dollars and so this is one of the demand vehicles that they use, you know, and they have an entire, you know, stock market. They have all these different, they have the treasury bonds where people buy into them. So if, the, if, if Ghana needs liquidity, they have to go to who? The IMF. Yeah. Because if they issue out bonds, mm. who the hell is going to buy them? Who trusts it? Mm. Fiat is just trust. Mm. Everything is trust. Business is trust. So who the hell is going to buy Ghana bonds, you know, if they, if they, if they issue our bonds? Nobody. And who, has, who, has, who wants the Ghana? There's no demand. So people don't have it in the reserves to even buy the bonds with the, the Ghana cities. Mm. And so the only way for them to get ahead is to print the money or to get the loan and become a slave even more mm. because it comes with austerity measures from the yeah, IMF. From the IMF. And they have to come within your system to manipulate things as well. Exactly. They're already here. They're already here. Yeah. And that's the game. Mm. And so this is how this whole thing works. Mm. And it all comes from belief, trust, the mechanisms that are in place, the financial instruments that we don't have that they have mm. in their game that they created. Interesting. How do we, is there any way we can escape from this and what's the way forward? I mean, you from, said... Yeah, for me, I, I really, look... I love Bitcoin a lot because I see what it's doing with El Salvador. It's transformed that, that entire economy. But the president is working for the people as the president should. If you saw what he did leveraging the military to be able to get into power, he, he eradicated 80% of the government, gone. He reduced taxes to zero. What did that do? It enticed foreign direct investments mm -hmm. to come in because also he eradicated the crime. That's another thing I didn't mention yeah. because they had a huge cartel mm -hmm. uh, in El Salvador. So he eradicated the crime first, right? Got rid of all the cartel. So safety, foreign direct investment, these are things that That's we need to work on, you know, in, in a di diaspora currently right now in unity, mm -hmm. you know? And um, with the currency, it's going to be very hard for them to do something that what El Salvador did because governments, they don't work and serve the people, but if they did, it makes obvious sense to use Bitcoin. Because even what El Salvador is doing now, mm -hmm. because they built up so much liquidity with Bitcoin, mm -hmm. now they can even pay back their debt from the IMF. Mm -hmm. And they can leverage that to do what? Make Bitcoin-backed bonds. But I, th I don't think that the, this country is borrowing from IMF really needs that money, to be honest. I think it's just something going on behind the scenes that force them into taking those money because Ghana have borrowed over two, three billion. Yes. You think we, we don't have three billion to liquidity to spare to the government or even the businesses don't? Yes. I think we do. But I think the West always have a way to kind of, kind of exercise control over these countries. But anyways, just to speak, what do you think? I mean, El Salvador is like, well, is it a Caribbean country? It's uh, on the other side of like Latin America. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's a... Uh, Bitcoin is very volatile, right? Today, Bitcoin value is what? I don't know what it is now, but yeah, it's like 70,000, something like 70, 000. that. 70,000. Yeah. Um, let's give it end of this year. It will go back to probably 26,000, 30,000, and probably shoot back up in four years, like you mentioned. Can a country govern with that kind of volatility? So, with time, it, it's becoming less and less volatile, and everything is volatile. When you look at the Ghana cities, <laughs> it's volatile against a lot of different currencies, right? And it's depreciating much faster. Mm. So when you look at the, the cases in like um, Lebanon and Turkey, you know, th their currencies are, Venezuela even, you know, they're at the point where some people are eating rats and, and you know, things are shit because, you know, the fiat itself mm -hmm. is depreciating so, so high. So it's volatile. It is volatile. You know, it's just that People don't see it. It's not, it's not obvious. Yeah, it's not obvious. It's hidden, you know, but there is a extreme volatility. It's actually better to have a self-sovereign currency that's decentralized and it's a peer-to-peer -peer network that nobody controls and it's apolitical, right? Mm. We but need isn't, didn't they say Bitcoin is, is owned by the CIA? But no, this is not true because you can see everything on chain. You could see, the, 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 you could see who owns what, but not the actual person. You see the wallet addresses, it's all on chain. It's the thing, it's all visible, it's all transparent. Mm -hmm. So if it was owned by the CIA, all owned by the CIA, you could see the mechanisms of the code and how it works, how it functions. It's completely decentralized. So the mm -hmm. network is not, it's not a, it's not a, there's no CEO, mm -hmm. there's no founder. It's a piece mm -hmm. of code on the internet. But at the end of the day, the, the person with the highest liquidity still controls the market. 
Y yes, because then, but then, that, the person with the highest amount of liquidity, mm -hmm. let's say in this instant, they still need goods and services. Mm -hmm. And so if that, that person that's basically offering the good or service, saying, mm -hmm. hey, no, I want Bitcoin, that's a way for them to extract liquidity from that person who has liquidity. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the good or services are always going to be needed. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there might be people with more liquidity than others, but at the end of the day, we still have an economy and we still have people offering goods and services. Mm -hmm. The medium of exchange, if it changes into something else, you would take that liquidity for that good or service, you know? Mm -hmm. So that way it will circulate around the economy. Mm -hmm. And this is what El Salvador figured out. And this is in, in their in their winning, mm -hmm. you know, in this in this sort of type of economy. Why do you think it's very difficult for African leaders to adopt this? Control. And also a lot of them are, I think, puppets to the West, unfortunately. Um, and I think that government was designed to serve the people but now the people serve the government and i think this is the real huge grunt of the situation you know the issue you know and i think that if if the governments were open-minded into relinquishing more control i think we would have a more fluid economy and society mm -hmm. but because they want more and more control they make things harder for the individual and for the person trying to actually solve problems mm -hmm. because if you look at dubai mm -hmm. zero percent tax there yeah you know because money is for free personal flowing income tax. It's it's no exactly. Personal income tax exactly exactly and money is free flowing there you know it makes it easy to do business it makes it easy to do stuff the easier you make things the more you attract investment the more you attract businesses mm -hmm. to solve problems mm -hmm. the harder you make things the harder it is for people to want to come here why would i come here if i got to do all this paperwork i got to register this do that do that it's, and i got to pay all this money and i got to pay this money again next year and pay all this money again the next year you're you should make the free market decide and the free market has already decided that they want this as a form of currency mm -hmm. now to what extent and how big this will get? Because right now, if you look at the global liquidity and measurement of Bitcoin, it's like, what, like 0.5% of all global liquidity. Mm -hmm. It's quite small, but if you look at it from the asset perspective, it's a top 10 asset in the world right now. So it's mm -hmm. liquid enough mm -hmm. um, to become a, a unit of account and a, um, a, a, something we can trade with, you know? So mm -hmm. it depends on the governments. Like I said, I don't want to be a Bitcoin maximist and say it's only Bitcoin is the only solution because you know, there's technological hurdles, maybe, you know, understanding how to handle software wallets and these things. But El Salvador fixed that through, you know, leveraging a company to be able to build the right software and the, the right mechanisms to make it easy for people, people to pay and change the unit of account. Because a lot of people think that you need to, you can only buy one Bitcoin. No, Bitcoin comes in, into, there's 100 million Satoshis as subunits of mm -hmm. Bitcoin. And you can mm -hmm. buy small subunits of it, mm -hmm. right? And use that to exchange. So like two sats can be a coffee. Right? Satoshi? Satoshis, mm -hmm. yeah. And so that's kind of how it works. And um, so this, again, this is stuff that I'm teaching in my academy, breaking down all these different nuances, because there's a lot of nuance with money to get to the point of fractional reserve banking, macroeconomics, microeconomics, mm -hmm. understanding cybersecurity, before you even get to, you know, cryptocurrency yeah. and, and understanding this stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Because some people lost their, what is the, the name of the website that got hacked? Uh, yes. So this is what happens. FTX and all these. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the issue is those are companies. Right. So the entire idea of crypto is for you mm -hmm. to hold the, the value yourself. It's like imagine like a wallet in real life, but you can store it digitally, you know, on, by yourself, just in a digital version. Right. And you secure it yourself and no one needs to know how much you have, mm -hmm. which is the, the true power is that no one can take it from you. It's the only mm -hmm. non confiscatable asset in the world right nobody can take it from you. that's true power and true financial sovereignty mm. what people were doing was they were taking their fiat deploying it into a company and having the company custodian it was what's the difference between that and a stockbroker it's that, the same that, i thought that was a standard no 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 that's just step one so you have to get a ledger and then yes you can get a hardware wallet mm. and secure your uh, your value mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. And that's like the, the sort of nuance, you know, that people don't understand. So they keep it then on these, these companies. And these companies are doing basically what the banks are doing. They're taking your money and they're loaning it out to other people. They're investing it, doing the same thing the banks do. The same exact thing. And then so guess what? It defies the, the... Yeah, it defeated the, the entire purpose. And people don't understand that because there's an educational gap. And so this is why I plan to fix is this educational gap to understand mm. what was the whole purpose of this. Tell us about some of the events you've done in Ghana, how the people reacted to it and, you know, how everything turned out. Yeah, so I actually just recently arrived in Ghana. So currently right now, uh, I plan to meet with some future politicians while mm. I'm here through my connect that I'm here on the ground with. 
and then I plan to reach out to universities to teach them this education because they need it, because the education system is flawed, not just in Ghana, but just in the entire world, it's so behind. By the time you, you finish learning, we're supposed to, if you look at just simple things like marketing, they don't teach you about TikTok marketing, YouTube marketing, YouTube ads, Google ads, Facebook ads. This is actually what real market podcast, how to set up a podcast, this is actual marketing. And they don't teach you these things in, in the school system. They teach you stuff that's quite, quite frankly primitive, you know? And this is across the board in the West, everywhere around the world. And what I, what I realize is we need to take control of the education system ourselves and empower our own people ourselves. And so part of the thing I plan to do is I'm going to different universities around Ghana, see if I can do strike uh, strategic partnerships with them to basically teach them this new form of technology that's coming in this exponential growth phase of technological advancement. And it's not slowing down. When you look mm -hmm. at artificial intelligence, Web3 technology, you look at uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, robotics, all coming at the same time. All, mm -hmm. It's not even coming, it's here. It's here, yeah. It's here. Yeah, it's just a matter of fact, so the majority of people start using them. Exactly. It becomes a norm. Exactly. So yeah, this is basically uh, what I'm doing. Also looking to buy land too while I'm here. Oh wow, um, really? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You want to be able to build something? Yes, yes. I want to build something, uh, not just for myself, but just for to help the diaspora if they need a place to stay. Mm. You know, these types of things to, to get people to come back, you know, and mm. this is what I, I plan to do. I plan to uh, achieve, you know, while like I'm here. A, like a, what, what has your experience been so far here in Ghana? And if you had to describe it, you know, a few sentences, what would you say? Peaceful. Peaceful. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Peaceful. Wow. You didn't have peace in America? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you, was, you said something behind cameras that slavery never um, ended. Yes. What do you mean by that? So after colonialism, as I described, is they created this Fugazi system mm -hmm. called fiat because, and also on top of that, <laughs> not only did they create this system, they also then struck these, uh, these sort of uh, post-colonial deals to where they could keep extracting cheap uh, resources and labor from us. So in effect, they planted then these, these puppets and put them in place to so obey. So they can just say yes to everything. Yes, because they're chasing this money that's not actually real and they think that this thing has, actually has value. And so what we ended up having was slave puppets in power to then continue on the slavery, listening to them, their master in the West. And, and this is the, the deep-rooted form of new slavery that I noticed. And I just realized this recently through asking why, and then asking why, and then asking why. So the, the further I got down the rabbit hole, I realized, ah, the money is the problem. The money is the problem. And so if we can fix the money, I think that the money at, at some point needs to be removed from the hands of humans. Mm. I, I just think it's, it's too powerful of a tool for somebody to control and decide when they want to levy that tool for their own benefit. Mm. And so this is why I really, really enjoy Bitcoin specifically, not crypto, because that's different. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin is a self-sovereign, decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer de uh, ledger system, right? Whereas crypto is leveraging blockchain technology as a company. Mm with a CEO. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. two separate things. That, mm -hmm. And I think it's another form of education people don't understand. It's, mm -hmm. two, it's two different things. And I think the money itself is corrupt and it causes pain and struggle in our continent. And sometimes I weep and I cry because mm -hmm. it's, it's sad what, they, what they've done. And um, knowing the truth now, um, I, the, only, the only solution, the only way forward for me is to bridge the diaspora mm -hmm. and play my part and play my role and, and have self-sacrifice. I could live peacefully somewhere else. Mm. The reason I'm coming back is not for myself. Mm. I'm coming back to change. If I can just change just a few lives, mm. I've done my part. Mm. That's deep. Yeah. I like that. If you do have a final message for the people watching you, people who have been enjoying the conversation so far, what would that message be? It would be that if you're ever curious or thinking about, about Africa, just book a ticket, man. Mm. Come see it for yourself and don't listen to anything that's going on in the mass media because they lie mm. all the time. They go to the worst parts of Africa and film BS about what Africa actually is. They don't film all the, all the amazing stuff that's being done, all the amazing work that's, that's being done here because they know that if they do that, then it's going to unconditionalize their programming that they mm. have in place. 
to keep Africa down, you know. And so I would say, if you, if you diaspora specifically, if you're listening to this, take it serious to maybe look into booking a ticket, try out Ghana, try out Rwanda, try out Kenya, try out these locations, mm -hmm. and see for yourself. Just you, the only way to figure out if something is true or not is to really get on the ground mm -hmm. and see for yourself what the truth is. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would say. I like that. Now it's so sad when our people in the diaspora just watch the TV and think they know what Africa is. Yeah. And then leave other ethnicities, Chinese, Lebanese, to come literally. Um, now that it's cheap, yeah. buy hectares and hectares of land, build infrastructure businesses, and then milk the money out of the system. And then they still live in their cubicles in New York, UK, yeah. and believe that they are living a better life. It's so sad if mm. you really understand it to the details yeah. of it. And I'm like, man, that's why I do this podcast. Yeah. Because people has been they've been lied to to the highest degree. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like look at if you're in a plane and entering the atmosphere of Africa, the land is I can be flying in six hours in Africa yeah. and there's still Africa. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. And people would rather live in a cubicle in New York than rather come here and buy hectares of land for yeah. themselves. Just because mosquito will bite them up just because yeah. <laughs> like it's sad bro yeah, yeah. it's really sad but hopefully watching these videos will change your mind you know just like he said book a flight ticket come find a truth uh for yourself anyways uh thank you so much for talking to me thank you i man. really appreciate it uh where we are currently filming this video is called gender place gender place is a co-working space uh located here in ghana accra east legon very close to american house uh your diaspora moving back here you want someone to plug and play if it's somewhere to meet high network individual, gender place is a place for you. And uh, trust me, the kind of people you meet when you come here, high level, great network for you. Uh, if you really want to, you know, move to Ghana, these are the people who might help you greatly on your journey. So make sure you check it out. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching. So without further ado, yeah. let's just say bye bye to the people watching. But before you do that, how do people find you? You can find me at uh, moonboycapitalventures.com, also moonboycapitalventures at gmail.com, and also I'm on LinkedIn too as well, uh, Vandross Idiake, which you, you know, you'll leave links down below for that too as well. And those are the three locations in which uh, you can find me if you have any, we'll do a collab business, anything like that, just hit me up. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so without further ado, let's say bye-bye to the people watching. All right, peace. Yeah. You'll see by that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. <laughs>